Welcome everybody to the April 28, 2022 pre-derby grand rounds lecture. This is traditionally always the chair's lecture and the chair gets to have fun with it. So there will be a quiz mainly for the students and the residents and hopefully we'll make it fun. I first wanna start out by saying happy birthday to my 86 year old mother who still gets down on her hands and knees and, and to clean her floor. Um, and why am I saying that? Because you know that um, your mitochondria come from your mother or X-linked. So thank you to my mother for the mitochondria she gave me. We're gonna talk about muscles today. And my title is uh, use them or lose them tongue in cheek, but don't, but don't abuse them. I have several disclosures. If you work with me, you know I am pretty much a vitaholic and I admit to having very strong opinions about vitamins and supplements. But I'm gonna try not I'm gonna try to stay in my lane and only produce you evidence-based studies. I'm also very fascinated by the diversity of the mammalian species, and yet we all have or yet we share some homologous diseases. I have no industry disclosures. And I'm really only an expert in endoscopy, so just so you know, this talk has nothing to do with endoscopy. It is true, I have a pile of pills in the morning with my cup of coffee, and I'll give you a clinical pill, pearl. Swallowing pills is easier with thick liquids like yogurt or smoothies. Never try to swallow a handful of pills with water alone. The water usually just runs around the pills. The learning objectives today are to review evidence of the many health benefits of physical activity and how a decline in physical activity is deleterious in all persons. I'm gonna address the differences very briefly between non-exercise activity thermogenesis, also called NEAT, and exercise. I'm gonna describe the causes of cramps, the pathophysiology, and potential treatments, and I'll use actual clinical cases to illustrate concepts. And this is important because using clinical cases just typically helps people remember better and also makes it more interesting. And then finally, some summarize recommendations for fluid electrolyte and mineral replacement associated with physical activity. So before I go on uh, with your test your mammalian muscle knowledge, I wanna acknowledge Kim Williams and the group from Rush that might be joining in today. Uh, we are so excited. Uh, in Louisville to have uh, Kim come with his um, interest, particularly in uh, preventative medicine, preventative cardiology, plant-based diets. So we're, we're gonna get along really, really well because we have a, a lot of faculty who are also interested in um, prevention. So thanks, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> so we're gonna start with which, uh, <clears throat> and at the end, I'll, uh, I'll get your answers to your questions. So residents, you know, you know I'm gonna call on you. Which mammal, mammal is the strongest? And I'm gonna say land mammal. Which species other than man suffers from rhabdomyolysis? Third, do animals get vitamin D deficiency? And fourth, which heart condition and in what mammal is on a steep rise in incidence over the last several decades? So the hard facts, no pun intended, about muscle mass is that they require tension and load for both effective contraction, recoil, and strength. And these three elements include stretching, anaerobic exercise, which can even just be walking and work or load. The sad news is by age 30, though, the average person loses about a half pound of muscle each year and gains about one pound of fat. By age 40, a majority of, of Americans weigh about 20 pounds more than they did when they graduated from high school. So you probably all remember what you weighed when you graduated from high school and you can see whether you're in that same band or not. Um, la loss of testosterone in both men and women with aging reduces our ability to maintain muscle mass. And finally, deconditioning results in loss of muscle mass, reduced exercise capacity, you can't do it anymore if you don't have the muscles to do it, and reduced anaerobic threshold. There is only one remedy for deconditioning, and that is to break that vicious cycle, you just have to move. So are there studies of health benefits of physical activity? There are multiple studies, and mainly over the last two decades. Exercise um, impedes the aging process and prolongs longevity. When I have an asterisk at the end of any of these bullet points, it's because I have 
associated literature at the end if you want to look at the references. Exercise benefits and reduces risk for diabetes, osteoporosis, hypertension, stroke, anxiety, and depression. And it has some primary preventative effect for both breast and colon cancer with some pretty good data to support that. It's a dose-dependent effect, and it can, the most important relative risk reduction is in cardiovascular disease. So physical fitness is most affected by the status of the cardiorespiratory and the vascular systems, as well as the muscle function. So those three elements have to come together. I love this statement by Robert Butler of the National Institute of Aging. It's a great statement. If exercise could be put in a bottle, it would be the strongest medicine money could buy. You can't find many other things that have a risk reduction of 20 to 35%, not medicines for sure. So the amount of physical activity needed to optimize health isn't clear, okay? So recommendations for adults follow CDC guidelines, and they usually include a recommendation of moderate intensity, 150 milligram, uh, mil minutes a week, or vigorous intensity for 75 minutes a week. But again, we don't know, and it may be different for different people. I mentioned in the introduction, not all exercises created equal, and the state of physical fitness is really a physiologic state that regards uh, you know, to your daily living or sports performance, and it is comprised of the health of your cardiovascular, muscular, and metabolic status. So fitness is more predictive of health outcomes. The more fit you are, the more these health outcome benefits apply to you. Whereas physical activity, it should be encouraged in nearly every person, all patients for sure. And eventually, if people do move, they will end up having more fitness. So uh, quite a while back, we realized that there are um, uh, unstructured movements in many people. Non-exercise energy and ex expenditure is what that's called. It's unrelated to what we normally do. It's unrelated to sleeping, eating, work, or sports. So it's the non-purposeful lifestyle embedded in physical activity. It's related to your body posture, ambulation, and fidgeting. So they realize that people who fidget, move around a lot more, wiggle their foot, they have a tendency to uh, exert more and burn more calories. Now, what's the, uh, that's the positive. What about the negative? What's the adverse health from inactivity? Sitting is a horrible thing to do. It is an occupational hazard. Um, and they have actually looked at outcome study with each hour of sitting after a total of seven hours sitting is associated with a 5% increase in premature death. More sitting at work is also associated with more sitting at leisure, which kind of makes sense because if you're used to sitting, then when you get home, you're tired, you sit. Uh, long sedentary hours are linked to at least twofold increase in diabetes, cardiovascular disease, 13% increase in cancer incidence, and 17% percent increase in cancer-related death. Another great statement by Edward Stanley, the Earl of Derby. This was a long time ago, 1873. Those who think they have not time for bodily exercise will sooner or later have to find time for illness. So the problem in, in America is we don't move enough. In fact, less than half of the population, when they look at state studies, meet the CDC exercise recommendations. And this decline in physical activity, unfortunately, correlates uh, social media and correlates uh, TV watching and sedentary activities. And it at least partially accounts for the obesity epidemic in both men and women. Um, surveys of physical activity in schools also show that exercise peak occurs in middle school. That's usually when they're doing cross country. And then it declines through high school and adult life. And there seems to be a divergence of, of students who want to go into sports and students who would rather uh, play uh, on their video games. Um, and another problem is uh, physicians do not consistently counsel their patients on the benefits of exercise and physical activity. In our zeal to be empathetic, if we've got somebody that says, doc, you know, my knees hurt, and doc, my, you know, my back hurts, we have a tendency to say, oh, I'm so sorry, but we don't say, you know, 
well, you need to you need to change that now. If you're having that problem now, you're going to really have problems in the future. So how can we benefit from then non-exercise associated thermogenesis, the neat thing I'm talking about? Well, you can act like a fidgeter if you aren't one. You can park in the back of the parking lot when you go to the grocery store or the mall. Instead of taking time to go up and down and find the closest one in the door, if you purposefully put yourself further away, then that will give you some more exercise. The other thing is standing more often. Uh, if you can buy an upright desk, if you have a, a sedentary uh, job, buy an upright desk if feasible. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. And then the use of pedometer, um, that started out in Japan as, as a way to get people to move around more, a, a little more than a decade ago. And a lot of people have pedometers now or Fitbits. <clears throat> and they've calculated that each step's about 2.5 feet, so 2,000 steps is about a mile. And then they've sort of arbitrarily designated low activity is 5,000 to 7,500 steps, and active is uh, greater than 10,000, which equates to about five miles. That's really an arbitrary determination, and it, and it really may be too little for children and may be too much for the elderly, so keep that in mind. So I like to do cases again because if I just babble, then you think uh, that I'm just, I've had too much coffee. So this is a real case of patient of mine, night cramps and palpitations. So I'm glad we have some extra cardiologists in the, off, in the uh, audience. This is a 48 year old insurance salesman. He seeks your help. Like many people, he takes PPI for GERD. He's on a diuretic for hypertension. And he says he doesn't drink a lot, that he has one to two Bud Lights most evenings. He's been told that he's pre-diabetic. His general physical exam is normal. His BMI is 26, so he's overweight but not obese. His routine labs, including CBC, CMP, thyroid studies are normal. His glomerular filtration rate is normal. His serum magnesium is 2. His C-reactive protein is mildly elevated, and his LDL is borderline, HDL is low, cholesterol is also elevated. He wants to exercise. He wants to feel better, but he says, I have cramps at night, and when I've tried to uh, go out and do anything, I get these weird fluttery feelings in my chest. So you order a stress echo, and you get an EKG, and they're normal and he has no ectopy on event monitoring. So I want you to think for a moment, what do you think this might be? What do you tell him about exercising? Will you put him on a statin? Would a, a high calcium scan score sway uh, your medical decision making? Do I have any takers for this one? Night cramps and palpitations. No takers, no volunteers to tell me what you think's going on? Okay, well, I'll give you the answer. He has magnesium insufficiency, or he could, and let's talk about this. His complaints of both cramps and palpitations are subtle clues, and here's the learning point. A normal serum magnesium does not predict total body stores. His diuretic use, his PPI use, and his daily alcohol are risk factors for underabsorption and overexcretion. Because he has normal renal function, it is safe to prescribe magnesium glycinate, 500 milligram daily, and monitor for resolution of his symptoms. You may consider discontinuing the diuretic and maybe even the PPI. And lastly, a calcium scan might help you decide to prescribe a statin if you're concerned uh, about muscle pain. So magnesium is the forgotten cation. Um, it was described in the 1920s to cure staggers uh, in cattle. Deficiency was described also in the 30s, and you can see it causes tremors, jerks, convulsions, ataxia, carpal tunnel, spasms, ileus, hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, and associated with arrhythmias. And then in 1935, uh, there was a report of termination of arrhythmias, presumed due to digitalis intoxication. But it seems like it wasn't until the early 2000s that magnesium deficiency really caught any robust attention. And the body stores, as you know, we have about 25 grams of magnesium, 60% is in our bone, 30 to 40% in our muscles, and 
intracellularly bound mainly to ATP. The serum contains less than 1% of the body's magnesium. Most of it is free, a third is bound to proteins, and some is complex with ions. Bone sources of magnesium is exchangeable with serum, and so that's the way we buffer and keep our serum levels looking normal. Meanwhile, we're slowly losing bone mineral density. So the key point here, the prevalence of magnesium deficiency is underestimated because of poor correlation between serum and tissue levels. I did read that, uh, that you can get uh, muscle biopsies and look, but people just don't do that. So low levels, if you measure one below two, that's low. Normal levels may still be associated with deficiency or insufficiency. The functions, it's very important. It's the fourth most abundant cation in the body and second most abundant intracellular cation after potassium. I kind of think of it like when I read labels in the grocery store. If you read high fructose corn syrup is the number one ingredient, <laughs> then you're getting a lot of high fructose corn syrup. Uh, magnesium being this abundant is probably pretty important, but we just don't think of it. It's involved in more than 3,000 systems as a cofactor that require ATP. And mod and for muscles, it modulates tension in both cardiac, skeletal, and smooth muscle. So it modulates vascular tone. It's been used successfully to treat hypertension. Uh, changes in intracellular magnesium have a profound effect on the transmembrane ion uh, channels for sodium, potassium, and calcium. It's an insulin sensitizer. Uh, it can regulate glycemic control or has a role in it. And it's anti-inflammatory and it also has uh, recently uh, touted immune modulating properties. So the associations of low magnesium include uh, memory decline, neurogenerative disease, depression, hyperemotionality, muscle weakness, fatigue, insulin resistance, diabetes, osteoporosis. Uh, it's been associated with the development of certain cancers, including breast, colon, and prostate. I've already mentioned the association with arrhythmias, coronary disease, hypertension, because of its inflammation and changes in vascular tone. If, if you are doubting that there's any uh, outcomes literature, there are, uh, for over the last couple of decades, double-blind placebo-controlled trials in patients with coronary disease. They looked at VO2 max. They looked at power output, ejection fraction. Uh, they correlated uh, uh, magnesium supplementation with endothelial function as well as exercise tolerance. Uh, they looked at people on a cycle or gonomer and um, and they've also uh, looked at athletes showing reduced resting and post-exercise systolic blood pressure. There was an IV magnesium uh, um, study in asthma, and so for acute asthma um, in the emergency room, um, people give IV magnesium that reduces uh, admissions to the hospital. So there's, for, for our endocrinologists in the audience, you, you guys understand this better than I do, and the interactions between calcium and, and vitamin D and magnesium to make the uh, uh, bone crystallization, there's a significant link for magnesium deficiency and osteoporosis. So the multiple causes, why are there, why, uh, are, is there so much magnesium deficiency, and is this really a, a, an epidemic? Uh, the answer is yes, it's really an epidemic. If you want to go right down to the bottom, um, males are supposed to get 420 milligram a day, and they're getting about 325. Females are supposed to get 320, and we're getting about 228 from our diet sources, and mainly because um, we either don't eat whole grains, we don't do what Kim Williams does, um, uh, brown rice, fruit, nuts, green leafy vegetables, and the soil is different today. It's been um, uh, over overutilized, and so the mineral content in soil is reduced compared to 50 uh, years ago. So uh, that that's a major problem. Um, so industrialized farming. The other is demineralized water. I, I don't know know if you know this association, but sudden death is twofold increased in homes with water softeners because we're leaching out the magnesium from the water. And it was already mentioned chronic alcohol intake that actually leads to a renal wasting mechanism uh, besides uh, a nutritional deficiency. 
renal disease alone, we, we always think, oh, no, don't give them magnesium if they have renal disease. Well, that's when they're at end-stage renal disease, but in early and many types of renal diseases, magnesium wasting is a problem, and sometimes your nephrologist will be supplementing your patients for their magnesium. And then diuretic uh, use. So when to consider magnesium deficiency? Obviously, if your patient has palpitations or arrhythmias, if they drink alcohol daily, if they have uh, other electrolyte disturbances, and many, many medications. PPI, the, probably the worst thing we've done is GI docs. I cringe almost every time I renew the PPI prescription because we really should be using it uh, much less than we do. We continue it on, and yet the the acute gastritis is gone, and we should be stopping uh, the PBI. Diuretics, beta agonists, aminoglycosides, et cetera, are other drugs. You can see them and look them up. Any GI malabsorption, chronic diarrhea, chronic pancreatitis, celiac disease, et cetera, can lead to magnesium deficiency. Pregnancy is a state of increased needs, so is lactation, refeeding syndrome, and again, I mentioned renal disease, prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, chronic inflammation. The positive outcomes uh, with uh, magnesium, although some of them are observational, migraine and common headaches, people supplement magnesium. Obviously, we supplement for bone mineral density. We give it in preeclampsia, and that reduces the incidence of eclampsia by 50%. Uh, I already mentioned reduced requirement for hospitalization and acute asthma. It was a small, not very good study, but it still was a pretty good study. Um, IV administration of magnesium improves outcomes in ICU patients. ICU patients with magnesium deficiency have higher mortality, more sepsis, and longer uh, stay. And again, it's used in cardiology. Most cardiologists know for arrhythmia, especially AFib, PVCs, uh, SVT in patients without underlying structural or ischemic heart disease. And lastly, muscle cramps. And it can be used for exercise-induced nighttime and neurologic. So identify if causes are acute or chronic and replete it. Start with two to four weeks of magnesium glycinate. If you use the oxide, you'll make your patients get diarrhea and they won't absorb it. If chronic, long-term replement or supplementation will be needed at a dose usually of 200 to 500 milligrams a day, depending on the size of your patients. And again, this is in patients with normal renal function and renal excretion prevents hypermagnesemia. So what happened to your patient? Well, he's happy because he has had no further palpitations since you put him on magnesium. He's playing tennis several times a week. He bought a stand-up desk at work, and he's now also running average five miles a week. He's lost a few pounds. He changed his medicine to lisinopril. He's on simvastatin and PPI still. Um, but he tells you he has leg cramps, worse a few hours after exercise, and occasionally will wake with severe nighttime cramps. And the pain lingers until the next day. So he's again discouraged about his exercise program. So he's, he's better, but he still complains of these cramps. So what do you suggest he do now? Could he still be magnesium deficient? What are the other reasons for his cramps? Let's talk about cramps. There uh, uh, is no consensus opinion of the cause of cramps. It's recognized that there are different kinds of cramps, some that occur, during exercise, which may be related more to fluid and electrolyte loss or lack of stretching. There are some afterwards that may be due to muscle fatigue. And there are some at night that may not be related to exercise at all. And there certainly are neurologic uh, diseases like uh, muscular dystrophies and ALS that may have a different mechanism. Um, there's been lots of study and lots of debate over, over cramps, and that's why uh, we, we don't have the answer. But here are some of the main things to consider. Again, for uh, metabolic or exercise associations, uh, chronic liver disease, again, it's nutritional. Uh, exercise associated usually is overworked muscles, low glycogen stores, or excess sweat. Um, Swimmers know about cramps, and there's two main mechanisms. One is cold water, and the other is pointing your toes, which you're not supposed to do. For those that exercise that are, I'm going to get out there and get going, if you're starting in the summertime, you will cramp because it takes about 14 days to train up and to be able to acclimate, to be able to act, 
accurately sweat to reduce uh, your body temperature. And so that takes about 14 days. A lot of athletes will go to the area where they're gonna perform in order to acclimate to the ambient uh, conditions. We uh, have about seven fluid and electro uh, uh, electrolytes that we lose, including sodium, which is the most important one, but also chloride, phosphorus, <laughs> calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate. So I think, um, and, and, and quite interesting, the telegrapher's cramps, uh, which were back in the days when they did Morse code, um, are the small muscle cramps, and that's for repetitive movement. There's no sweating, there's no electrolyte loss in that, and that's again kind of a demonstration that there's more than one mechanism behind cramps. So, so treatments may need to be different based on the causation. For athletes, about 70% of us will get sporadic or recurrent. And again, they're more common in endurance cycling, swimming and running. Um, again, you're either pushing too hard, you're getting dehydrated. Remember, you can lose up to five pounds of water before becoming symptomatic. And remember the associated electrolyte loss. Uh, the ergonomic considerations, if you're a cyclist, uh, improper fit to the bike, toe down, seat too high, not alternating muscle groups. Uh, again, mentioned pointing toes during swimming, failure to properly stretch. Low glycogen intake, it is recommended uh, to eat uh, 100 kilocalories per 50 kilogram every 90 minutes if you're doing endurance exercise or you might bonk. Okay, what is sweat? Sweat, again, is a mechanism to lower body temperature and um, it's highly individual in uh, different people though. You can, you can read where you lose uh, 200 milligrams of sodium per liter to 2,000 milligrams of sodium per liter. And fluid losses vary as well between you know, half to 1.8 liters an hour of exercise. And obviously it depends on how rigorous the exercise and what the outside temperature is. Dehydration studies, interestingly, from the 1930s when they um, per, uh, built the Hoover Dam revealed that sodium was one of the most important uh, electrolytes lost. And, um, and they, they did some physiologic testing then. And, and that's why, if you remember 30 years ago, everybody was given salt tablets in, uh, in, in high school sports. We don't do that anymore. Um, but important to know, plasma concentrations don't reflect the intracellular changes. What are some of the recommendations? If you're really serious about this and you really wanna know about your sweat, you can mail away and get a sweat analysis and see whether you have high sodium sweat or low. Um, you can weigh yourself before and immediately after exercise. Um, you're supposed to replace with a uh, half a liter for every one pound of weight loss. And you can prehydrate half a liter for three to five hours with a pinch of salt. What you're not supposed to do is drink large quantities of plain water. It's, it's um, it's still best to place what you lost, which is still hypotonic, but not plain water. So the ideal formulations, you can find lots of them. Uh, I think the thing to remember is that Gatorade and Powerade are hypertonic. They have way too much uh, calcium, I mean, uh, sodium, and they have way too much sugar. It is true that sugar is a co-transporter and will allow you to absorb that sodium, but your sugar solutions should be no more than three to 6%. So in essence, if you're only exercising less than an hour, all you need is water. For more rigorous exercise, sweating or ambient heat, you need to replace electrolytes. And because you can find Gatorade and Powerade in stores and not these other, uh, uh, other um, commercial products which you have to buy online, if you dilute one part of your Gatorade or Powerade to two parts of water, you probably have the right replacement. Coconut water has become popular because it's higher in potassium, but it still probably has too much sugar. And just remember that sports drinks should be hypotonic to almost isotonic. So what are you gonna recommend for your patient? Make sure he's educated about rehydration. You can tell him about quinine, it's been used since the 30s for malaria uh, spasms, and there is a Cochrane review that says it does reduce the number and intensity of cramps. Um, you can still replace magnesium because he's probably still insufficient, but remember magnesium may not be the only uh, uh, 
thing he's missing. He might not be properly stretching. Some people recommend Tums. Uh, honestly, there's so much calcium being uh, supplemented in most of our uh, uh, beverages these days uh, that that calcium insufficiency is not as big a problem as it used to be. We know about peppermint working through calcium channel blockers. You can put it in a bathtub. Is there anything else? Is there anybody out there that wants to say anything else that could help this man's cramps? Aha, pickle juice. So uh, Henry Sadlow sent me uh, um, Dr. Elliot Tapper, who's a gastroenterologist, by the way, just conducted a randomized controlled clinical trial published this month in serotics with cramps, and he used visual analog scales to, to, to show that, that, that they had reduced number and intensity of their cramps. It's been known for a while, though, that we have these uh, TRP receptors in our oral pharynx, and what happens uh, is there's decreased firing of the alpha motor neuron that innervates the affected muscle. It's not the salt, it's not the pickle, but the acetic acid that is the key causal ingredient. And that's why just a sip in the back of your oropharynx is gonna uh, potentially ameliorate that cramp. Now, um, even though Dr. Tapper, who's done this randomized controlled trial, is probably going to get the credit for this, I like the fact that Hippocrates not only said all disease begins in the gut, but foolish the doctor who despises the knowledge acquired by the ancients because he used apple cider vinegar for cleaning wounds and a, a variety of ailments. And as you know, apple cider vinegar is also rich in acetic acid, so it works through the TRP receptors. If you haven't tried it, if you have cramps, take a sip of apple cider vinegar or eat a pickle and, and you'll be amazed that you're not replacing that salt in two seconds, but you are uh, following that uh, neuro neurological uh, break there to, uh, to ameliorate the cramp. Phase two, depression and fatigue. This happens, I have 10 people like this. This was a young lady from India. She was studying at our medical school she had some unwanted weight gain, she was irritable, she had emotional lability, she reported poor sleep hygiene due to need to study late. She was trying to work to reduce her student loan debt, so she was literally just burning the candle at both ends. She used to run in college, but she says she just has no energy at the end of the day. She asks you if you think she needs an antidepressant, She's not on any medication. She doesn't smoke or drink. Her family doesn't have a history of depression. Her parents are alive, both have hypertension. She says she feels safe in her dorm. Uh, she has had heavy menses since a young teenager. You do a physical exam and it's normal and she only has a depressed mood. So what do you do to evaluate these complaints? Do you prescribe an antidepressant? Do you tell her to shape up and go to the gym? Do you refer her to psychiatry? Any takers on this one? What's wrong with this girl? Or what could be wrong with this young lady? We're shy today. Well, her BMP, TSH, CRP, urinalysis are normal. Her CBC shows microcytic cells. Her hemoglobin is 11.5. Her vitamin D level is in the basement at nine nanogram per mil. You check her formal iron studies. She's also iron deficient. So, the answer to the question is you always, even in a young person, look at labs and before referring to another doctor and making an assumption. Um, so she's vitamin D deficient and you know that vitamin D can be associated with fatigue and depression. So you go ahead and you replace her. You start her on iron and you start her on 50,000 IU a week for vitamin D and then for six weeks and then 4,000 thereafter with your plan to check it. Uh, you review her sleep hygiene because she's obviously uh, working too hard and you make a few changes. You stress the importance of getting sunshine on uh, the backs of her arms or her forehead without sunscreen in order for her to uh, convert her D3 uh, to the active variety. We have lots of studies of vitamin D and musculoskeletal health and for muscle recoil in the sports literature, the vitamin D level that's optimal is 60 to 80 nanogram per mil. 
Recent studies also recommend for optimal bone health, a level above 30, and most of the endocrinologists like to aim for 50. And to remind you of the definitions, deficient is less than 20, insufficient 20 to 29, optimal 30 or above, but less than 100 with toxicities not really showing until you get to about 150. So at three month follow up, she's now running one to two miles a day. She's compliant with her medication. She reports improved mood. She's got increased energy. She's lost a few pounds. She doesn't think she needs a psychiatrist. She's happy and smiling. Her hemoglobin is now normal after three months of iron. Uh, you will check that in the future with her heavy menses. Her vitamin D has come up, but you plan to continue on current dose and recheck in another three months. Keep in mind the vitamin D half-life is about 90 days. And um, so, you know, just checking it once and not checking it again is, 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 not, is not what we recommend. Another case, 57-year-old female at breakfast, eating coffee, pancakes, oatmeal, and carb-loaded meal. This is day five of a 444-mile multi-day ride. She's also taking her usual supplements and vitamins and then notes more of a ginger taste than on prior days. When she examines the plastic bag, all the pills are the same color. There are three different, there's the Advil and the ginger root and the Garana. She estimated that she swallowed at least 10 of each, maybe more. This was the wrong baggie. This was the rescue supplement baggie in case of nausea, headache, or low energy. She finishes her breakfast, it's 7.30 a.m. She plans to try the 105 mile ride despite the incidental ingestion. Predict the next seven to 10 hours, what's your diagnosis? A par did Lonnie, are you on? <laughs> any, any resident or fellow gonna tell me what this girl did wrong? They're not gonna unmute their mic. Okay. Well, uh, Garana, the 900 milligram Garana, Paulinia cupana, is a Brazilian climbing plant. It looks like eyeballs, and so the um, uh, Amazonians call it fruit like the eyes of God. And it's been used for centuries for its therapeutic properties. It was commercialized in 1958. The reported benefits include combating heart disease, aging, reduce skin sagging, provide energy, vitality, improve cognition, reduce fatigue. It's a fat burner, it increases metabolism. Today, it's used in our sports energy drinks. It's the main source of caffeine for our sports energy drinks. And in fact, it's got twice as much caffeine as the coffee bean does. So that 900 milligram uh, capsule contained 200 milligrams of pure caffeine, which is at least equivalent to two cups of coffee. Other, uh, other things in Garana include theobromine, theophylline, antioxidants, uh, including tannin, tannins and saponins that have an antioxidant profile similar to green tea. So today, 70% of the world's Garana is used uh, uh, for energy drinks, and the other is for powders, pills, or potions. So it was estimated that this cyclist consumed approximately 1,200 milligrams of caffeine, equivalent to 12 cups of coffee, in addition to the three cups she drank at breakfast. So Dr. Pfeiffer gave an excellent grand rounds about caffeine, I mean about coffee, and he mentioned that he wasn't going to talk about caffeine, but that coffee's benefits uh, three to four cups a day tops and, and how that's, that's beneficial. But let's keep in mind that, this, that coffee and guarana still contain a drug, and caffeine is the world's most consumed drug. Some of the reasons why you call it a drug is it has addictive properties and it has withdrawal symptoms. So this was formerly a restricted substance by the International Olympic Committee and World Anti-Doping Authority. It was removed off that list in 2013 because of the highly ergogenic effects at even low doses um, with minimal short and long-term side effects. And so it was socially accepted worldwide. I will tell you the NCAA still bans athletes with urinary caffeine concentrations exceeding 15 microgram per mil 
and that's equivalent to about six to eight cups of coffee two to three hours before competition. There are tightly controlled trials about caffeine, and they are pretty cool, uh, demonstrating the ergogenic effects, the ener energy that's given to the muscles. There's lots of trials uh, of patient of subjects being their own controls, looking at their jumping height, agility testing, stop and go sports, sprinting and cycling, showing a benefit. It is a CNS stimulant. It does improve wakefulness, cognition, and mood, and it and it um, interferes with feedback from muscles to reduce pain perception. And so uh, athletes may, uh, may, may work harder because they hurt less. And it's, these effects are especially strong when the athlete is already tired from prolonged activity. As Dr. Pfeiffer mentioned, caffeine crosses the blood-brain barrier and it binds to the adenosine receptors and that's how it, it, it extinguishes those pain perception. The, uh, most of the sports authorities have come to the agreement that the recommended dose that is safe is six to nine milligram per kilogram of uh, body mass, or three to four cups daily will usually get you there. Caffeine is water and fat soluble, it's metabolized by the liver, and because it has a variable half-life, this is just a recommended dose. You'd almost have to do a study on each person to understand uh, what their uh, actual genetic metabolic um, effects are. So what happened to this accidental uh, caffeine overdose cyclist? She felt okay for about three hours, maybe because of variable gastric emptying or pill digestion delay. At noon, she developed agitation, was very tremulous, had the feeling of high pressure in her head with tinnitus in her ears. She found uh, fought nausea all the way to the destination and shortly after had dry heaves, couldn't go to dinner had excessive urinary voiding. She tried to rehydrate with water and Gatorade to replace fluid losses, and she took more ginger for nausea. She, although she had a rough night, she was pretty well recovered the next morning, but declined her cup of coffee at breakfast. And the only follow-up is to this day, she still uses Garana, only one tablet per ride, and she avoids additional caffeine. She also labels her, labels her vitamin baggies with more rigor. So test your mammalian muscle knowledge. Which animal has the strongest muscles? Do I have anybody that wants to say who has the strongest muscles? And if you're too, if you're too shy to do that, you can type it in the chat area too. <laughs> On the land, it's an elephant. In the water, it's a whale. Which mammal suffers from rhabdomyolysis similar to man? Horses do. Do animals get vitamin D deficiency? No, because they're covered yes. with fur. <laughs> they're covered with fur, so most of the, the furry ones don't. They have a different uh, pathway, and so vitamin D deficiency is not a problem animal. Okay, which heart condition in which mammal is on the rise over several decades? And see in the chat, we have one of, yeah, somebody mentioned it said cardiomyopathy in cats. It's actually, well, there is cardiomyopathy in cats, but AFib, there's cardiomyopathy in dogs. Um, AFib in horses, um, and now there's much debate since they're, as to whether this is a training effect. They're very highly, you know, vagal beasts, vagal machines. But um, a lot of the vets um, are supplementing with magnesium, and uh, they believe that that is a nutrient deficiency that is, you know, on the rise because of the soil conditions, whether you let them feed in the grass or there's a deficiency in their grain. So a lot of, lot and lot, a lot of articles on atrial fibrillation in horses. All right, so I would like uh, us to uh, end with uh, just move it, neat, and exercise are both beneficial for health. Wiggling, standing, use of upright desks are associated with lower BMI and overall health. Just walking each day uh, has as many longstanding health benefits as doing formal exercise. Um, everyone can benefit from any kind of physical activity, including if you're in the hospital. Um, 
And for optimal physical activity, you've got to look for and replace deficiencies, including iron, magnesium, vitamin D, review all substances taken. I didn't even get into, uh, you know, hydroxymethylbutyrate and, and, and uh, um, other, other supplements that people take for their, their muscles. Um, review, though, and reinforce hydration and, and, and let people know that pure water is bad, pure Gatorade is bad. If they mix the two, it, they'll, they'll do better. Review sleep hygiene and improve if needed. People have to get rest in order for you to have uh, calcium enter into your muscles. I have lots of references if people want them on each of those topics. Physical activity, cramps, caffeine, magnesium, vitamin D, and that's that's it. So I would hope we have some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kruger. That was uh, amazing and uh, engaging. I have two quick questions. Of course, it has to do with vegan diet because we get these questions all the time. It, it looks like uh, most of the vitamin D that people get from uh, foods are in things that have high cholesterol, such as egg yolks and the like. And so we get that question all the time, is how can people who are on a, on a plant-based diet, assiduously avoiding the consumption of cholesterol, get vitamin D? And when you look it up, it's pretty much mushrooms. Uh, similarly, switching topics is the, uh, the where do you get magnesium? And it, the answer seems to be almonds more than anything else, almonds, spinach. Um, so what do you recommend to the people who have plant-based, and I'm sure you see them because of the robust data on plant-based nutrition improving inflammatory bowel disease, so you probably see some of these people. I do, and I I start, Kim, with, with actually checking their levels because um, it's hard to, unless somebody is really rigorous and brings you not only I eat mushrooms, I eat almonds, you know, when I start to talk about individual diets with, with, with my patients, a lot of them are all over it. But if I check their level and it's low, then they have a choice. Their choice is to eat more of those things that, can, that, that you and I both know contain, supposed to contain magnesium and vitamin D or to supplement. So that, that's, that's how I address that. I do take a diet history, and, um, but I do check their levels. Actually, I had a lady um, this past Monday that her nurse practitioner put her on vitamin D, and she start she's just having more and more and more neurologic thought, nervousness, et cetera. So I looked in her chart, and because her nurse practitioner started her on the vitamin D, her nurse practitioner was following her levels, and 10 months ago, her level was 98. So I said to her, uh, I'm going to check a level because I think you might actually be toxic. It's very hard to get toxic, but this lady was still taking 50,000 units a week for like two years. So her level was 118, and I called her yesterday and said, you might want to back down on that. I'd be curious to see how, you know, how her overall psychology changes once she's no longer in the toxic range. All right, actually, we have a question in the chat from Dr. Kalra. He wants to know, does time of day have much effect with respect to benefits of exercise? Lots of controversy. <laughs> well, yeah, because you get into the interference with your circadian cycle. So if you uh, exercise at night, uh, you may have a bad night's sleep, and then you're fatigued in the morning. Uh, if you exercise at 5 a.m., <laughs> you're more uh, hypercoagulable. So, you know, even fit runners who are found, you know, more often dead on the road at 5 a.m. because that's, that's when you have the lowest oxygen. Uh, uh, and, I, and I don't know if we figured out if that's a cortisol-related uh, effect or not. So a very good question uh, about time of day for exercising. Um, so, you know, the other part about that is, is you have to make time in your day to exercise and you know i think each individual figured out on a weekend it's like when you don't have to get up in the morning and you don't have to wear a watch you know to wake yourself you'll know how many hours of sleep you actually need so the sleep literature is pretty profound you at least need five and a half to six hours to be able to function to be able to do surgery regardless of whether you're an intern or a resident 
Um, most people need about seven and a half or eight hours. So Americans already don't sleep enough. So on the weekends when you're not working, uh, which you should try not to work every weekend, figure out for yourself what time of day is better uh, to exercise. For most of us, it's around, you know, a couple hours after we've woken up and we're moving around and we've had our cup of coffee and we've had a little bit of breakfast to break our fast. So it's around 10 o'clock in the morning. 10 to 2 is probably prime time for exercise for most people. All right, I have a question from Kim Pate and she wants to know thoughts on Epsom salts and magnesium for muscle soreness. Love it. Um, so, you know, our skin is a big organ and we can we can absorb a lot through our skin. I mean, salon pass is a great way to uh, to absorb through the skin. So our Epsom salt. Uh, Epsom salt is is wonderful for muscle soreness. It's highly recommended. I recommend it to a lot a lot of patients. I don't know whether it will absorb to the point that it can keep you restored. And because of the the uh, the use of uh, water softeners and the depletions in the soil and the high use of PPI, a lot of people are slowly becoming magnesium deficient. Um, the cardiologist might, you know, might comment on the number of patients that have, you know, intermittent AFib that have a structurally normal heart. And you're not gonna find them in super young people. It's usually gonna be older people. And I wonder if there's not that underlying magnesium deficiency. All right, um, that's, if anybody has any more questions, you can uh, feel free to unmute and ask, or if you wanna, uh, you can also type it in the chat area. We still have a couple of minutes here for, uh, for some questions. Hey, hey, Jason and Chris. Yes. Hey, Henry. Kind of Hey, how you doing? Um, one thing that I tell my patients is that there's a KET program called Sit and Be Fit on every morning during the week. And for people who walk in with a cane and say they can't do exercise, uh, this is a nice thing to recommend to them. It's, I think, 25 minutes, five days a week, you know. And uh, so I always try to mention that to people that are mobility impaired. Yeah, you sent me that link, Dr. Sadlow. Is that is, so? That's something. That's like something they can, someone can find on demand, or they can find the link to to watch that. Or yes, yes, they can. And I think it's on at seven thirty on KET two every morning. But I also have a little brochure that I hand out to most every patient that talks about the hundred fifty minutes per week and the American Heart Association. That's in the same brochure, so I can get that to anybody. It's a two page thing if they want to hand it out like I do in the office. Uh, feel free to contact me. So on that on that note, since that's a CDC guideline, you know we have uh, these quality uh, indicators uh, in our electronic medical record. You know, have you have you counseled your patient on smoking cessation? Have they had their screening colonoscopy? I would love to see. You know, do you actually have them track? their number of minutes a week of activity and do you ask questions about do they have a Fitbit or do they uh, stand? Again, again, if you can affect somebody's outcome or reduce their risk of sudden death or cardiovascular disease by 20 to 25 percent, I mean that's just that's just so far greater than uh, than any medication that we prescribe that we really, really need to focus on getting people moving. I had a question about uh, the time of this uh, 150 minutes or whatever it was. Uh, okay. What if you just knock that out on a Saturday? Am I good for the rest of the week? Yes. Yes. Dr. Yeah, Royer, I recognize your voice. Yes, you actually can. So that was good that you pointed that out, that intermittent activity is as good as routine daily activity. So it is cumulative. It is there is a dose effect. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. All right, Dr. Kerr, I have a question from uh, Dr. Philip May. He's one of our community doctors. He's a frequent guest. Uh, he wants to know: Should we all be wearing a Fitbit watch? <laughs> well, um, if you want to get fit, what you what you per, uh, per, permit, you promote, and what you measure, you usually get better with. So. We are creatures of habit, and if we get in the habit of, of looking at that Fitbit, 
just like we all have that extra appendage now called the cell phone. I think everybody knows it's an, an additional body part. Uh, so having a Fitbit will probably result, and, and there are studies that show that people that follow their Fitbits do do better. All right, everyone. If you have um, kind of last round up here, if you uh, any if you have any more questions, again you can uh, unmute and ask, or if you want to type it in the type it in the chat area, we, uh, we got like got a minute or two here left to go. So, or if not, Dr. Kruger, thank you. <laughs> that was okay. That was All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week, and try to try to incorporate exercise in your own. Um, daily routine or on the weekend but be but be careful yeah definitely and uh again want to thank everybody for joining us thank you dr williams for joining us today and uh for the folks from rush you're able to able to stop by and it's, it's a it's really cool <laughs> we're glad to have you thanks so much great having good great being here take care and uh Bye -bye. just let everybody yeah, let everybody know we'll be back again next week. Uh, we just have uh, actually, I, I believe, uh, three more regular grand rounds and then awards day on May 26th. So next week is uh, infectious diseases. Um, we have a, actually have an outside speaker coming in. Uh, so that'll be great and looking forward to that. So that's next week, May 5th at 8 a.m., same place, same channel. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us this morning and uh, we'll see you next week.